I thought uh, to present two cases to you that I had seen in the clinic that might pertain, uh, and I like to bring up like, several points as I go through the cases. One pertains to the diagnosis of MPN, how it was made, and the other one has to do with the management. So I hope you find them of interest. So the first case is about a 75-year-old man who came to the heme clinic uh, because the nephrologist who evaluated him at Rush to undergo kidney transplant noticed that his hemoglobin was high. Okay, so the gentleman had history of high blood pressure and his kidneys had failed, so he was already on dialysis. And he heard about this transplant business with the kidney, so he said, okay, let me go see someone and they may be able to um, you know, perform a transplant. And notice that he's already been seeing someone since 2017. So his kidneys have gradually failed, probably because of high blood pressure, but I can't rule out other causes. Um, so he's been followed by multiple doctors, right? So why did it take so long until he saw this physician that noticed, well, gee, why this patient with kidney failure has a hemoglobin of 17.8? And that number, if you don't know, I mean, generally speaking, patients who have kidney failure tend to be anemic. In fact, they end up getting EPO, which is the hormone that the kidneys produce to prevent them from getting transfusions, typically. So first and foremost, I thought this was an astute observation, right? Because had he not paid attention to that, I, as a hematologist, would not have seen this patient. And I'm sure that this occurred before he came to see this nephrologist at Rush, right? He was already on peritoneal dialysis. The point here is to say that a lot of times people have MPNs, we don't see them. We might see them after the very first catastrophic event, pulmonary embolus, a stroke, whereas the blood abnormalities may have gone on for some time. So it continues to be a problem to identify patients who have MPN and make that diagnosis because we may not see them early enough. Nonetheless, I was impressed because he too ordered the JAG2. I was a little envious of that. I'm like, that's my job. I want to order the JAG2 mutation, but he had already done so. <laughs> Why is he ordering that nonetheless? But it came back positive and that's how he landed in my clinic. So uh, we sat down and talked about his symptoms and I said, so do you have any symptoms? Not at all. He had none. Well, then we sat down and talked a little bit more about it, more in details. I said, have you noticed anything different about your skin color? Oh yeah, you know, people have been telling me that I'm a little bit flushed in the face. In fact, my hands are a little bit. Okay, well, ha are you having any, perhaps, pain on your right side? You know, now that you're mentioning it, I do have a little bit of pain. When I bend down, I get a little bit of discomfort. Well. <laughs> Those are symptoms, and those are symptoms that may be, I would say, definitely related to his disease. So when people say that they're not symptomatic, I think you can't take that at face value. You have to go after each symptom at a time, and I couldn't agree more with Dr. Haas and the comment that she made about the MPN10, because I'll tell you, when I give the uh, questionnaire to my patients, they themselves are surprised at the score that they get. Wow, I didn't realize I was gonna get a 32, for example. You know, so um, I can't overemphasize doing that. So okay, when I examined him, I noticed that he had a spleen of 10 centimeters below the castle margin. So this isn't, you know, some mild splenomegaly. And because his hemoglobin was 17.3, not everything fit, like his, um, uh, he, he didn't meet the 18.5 criteria, and actually his hemoglobin kinda trended down over time. So I opted to do a bone marrow biopsy, although again, having said that, um, and again, because he was gonna go for transplant or consideration of transplant, I wanted to be sure that we were dealing with the right, with the appropriate stage of his disease. And that came back as uh, consistent with um, uh, PV, or I should say an object to positive MPN. And then I typically order an iron stain and a reticulin stain on all my patients. And in his case, even though he had hemoglobin of 17 sky high, he had no iron stores, zero in his bone marrow. That's another tip, okay? So 
if your patient is iron deficient, how come that they can make that much hemoglobin? Typically, people who have P. Viera have a bone marrow that's on such overdrive that they actually suck all the vitamins and nutrients to make that red cell, right, which is actually the basis of why we end up phlebotomizing them so that their marrows do not have any iron to make excess red cells. I thought that was very interesting. But again, having said that, I'll be honest with you, and maybe my colleagues would disagree, but I thought that he should go and have a GI evaluation because I can't rule out that maybe that no iron that's available in his marrow may have been related to a GI bleed. After all, people who have PV may have a slightly higher risk of peptic ulcer disease and GI bleeds, also because of some platelet dysfunction. So that's, that was that, and we made the diagnosis. So ultimately, after we did the, made this diagnosis, we uh, decided to assess his risk. I think you heard from Dr. Hobbs. I'm not going to go over uh, that in details, take care of the symptoms, assess uh, the risk, and then talk about the treatment. And to me, in my clinic, and I'm sure most MPN experts that are here would agree that patient education is extremely important. I want my patients to be partners with me in taking care of this disorder. So, and I find that education is the very first way to do that. So you need to know what to, what to do, what to monitor for, when to pick up the phone and call me. If you're gonna go to have surgery, call me because I wanna make sure that your blood counts are taken care of. So, uh, what we did in, instantaneously with that high uh, hemoglobin is that we phlebotomized the patient, we started him on baby aspirin, as well as cytoreduction with hydria, because obviously he's high risk by the mere age. And frankly, I don't know if his uh, kidney failure was induced by a vascular event. That remains to be seen. <clears throat> and just to show you, <clears throat> uh, that's a graph of what his blood counts look like. And I know the numbers can be really hard to see, but blue, between blue and green is what's supposed to be normal. That's the normal hemoglobin, right? So you can see at the very top, he was 18 something when he came, and then ultimately we managed to kind of get him to below 45%, which is the ideal target. Uh, it took some time, but ultimately he got there. Um, the same thing happened to his white cell count. He also had leukocytosis, and again, um, with cytoreductive therapy, this was optimized. So we need to educate primary care physicians so that they don't accept cytosis or high white cell count and blame them on reactive conditions. Okay, you have an infection, maybe your leukocyte count, white cell count will go high, but until the infection is under control, that should go away. If that persists, then you have to ask a hematologist. Um, I can't overstate that. And then, of course, we as MPN uh, docs, we need to delve into the symptoms a little bit more. And don't believe um, when someone says, I just have no symptoms. You have to ask specific questions. So that's my first case. Any questions on that before I move on? Now, this one is a little more complicated. And that just, I just put that together because I was just stunned by um, the way her case was handled. And I think a lot of us, myself included, we tend to obsess over the numbers. We want to control those numbers. We want them to be perfect. But I think we can't, you know, do this and uh, kind of kill the quality of life. The, the patient is not just a number. There's a quality of life measure that's linked to it. So this lady is 50 years old. She was diagnosed with essential thrombocythemia and came to uh, see me in September of 2017. Her initial diagnosis VT was in 2012 when she had the CBC routinely done and she had very high platelet count and a little bit of anemia and her uh, testing showed that she was MIPL positive. So this is very straightforward. And at that time she truly didn't have any symptoms and she had no bleeding clotting events. She's 50 years old. And so nothing was really done. Later on, she had, uh, was identified to have a tumor, a benign tumor. So she went and had surgery. Unfortunately, after the surgery, she ended up with a clot in her leg. Now, did those high platelets contribute to that? Possibly. Was that induced by the surgery? Possibly. But the point is that she developed a clot, and for that reason, uh, she was started on blood thinners. 
And after that, the physician thought that, well, now she's high risk by the mere fact of that clot, although you could argue that maybe it was provoked. If you didn't have the surgery, maybe she would not have had it, in which case you would not have treated her nonetheless. Uh, but the platelets continue to skyrocket, okay? Um, they repeated the bone marrow biopsy to see what was going on, and again, as Dr. Hobbs was mentioning, that entity of prefibrotic myelofibrosis, the pathology started to wonder, like, hmm, this may not be actually ET, maybe this is MF, and of course, her anemia didn't help, because as you know, people who have ET shouldn't really have anemia, right? It's just isolated elevation in platelet count. Well, then she continued to drop her hemoglobin, and people said, well, you know, maybe this MF is progressing. Ultimately, she became transfusion dependent, and because she was extremely fatigued, she wasn't even able to go to work. Finally, her doctor decided to start an agrolide, all right? And so they started 0.5 milligrams, and then together with the hydria, because the platelet count was really high and it continued to escalate, Ultimately, it got close to 2 million, and the doctor kept chasing it, right? So at some point, she was taking 3 grams of hydria and 3 grams of anagrolide. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's a pretty hefty dose, huge dose. Meanwhile, her anemia continued to go down. And so the doc finally was so frustrated. I'm like, okay, let's just stop the hydria, continue the anagrolide, and send her to Dr. Sham. I don't know what to do about that anymore. Meanwhile, she... Um, developed extreme belly pain, went to the emergency room, was scoped. They found out that she had this infection in her stomach called H. pylori, and that predisposes people to bleeding, okay? So she probably was bleeding from her stomach from that gastric ulcer and H. pylori infection for quite a while, which is probably why she was anemic in the first place. But then after this happened, they decided, let's stop the blood thinner because now this lady is bleeding. She's requiring transfusion. So. Then they repeated her GI workup. So just me telling you the story, doesn't that make you exhausted? It's just exhausting to think about all those things that she kind of went through. Nonetheless, um, when she came, we said, you know what, let's start all from scratch, because it was very complicated. Many things have happened. She's been seen in multiple places. I decided to make sure that she, her disease hasn't truly progressed. Bone marrow biopsy was done. Well, there's really no increase in blast. Her cytogenetics are normal. Uh, she does have a little bit of fibrosis. And she, too, had no iron in her bone marrow. Why would this lady have no iron in her bone marrow? Well, I knew that she had that GI, um, you know, that bleeding ulcer, that infection. So as controversial as it may be, because most people who have MF ultimately end up transfusion dependent. I was stunned by the fact that even though she received transfusions, she was still without any iron in her bone marrow. So we ultimately ended up giving her two grams, uh, two infusions of IV iron because the oral iron that she was taking wasn't actually kicking in. And, and then I decided to take her anagrolide dose down because no matter how high you went on it, platelet count was completely off. So, and as as some of you might know, anagrolide will induce anemia. So we started reducing her dose. Of course, I was met with some resistance because, you know, there was some fear there, like, mm, what if I get, you know, more clots, da, da, da. But she ultimately agreed. And so here's what happened to her hemoglobin. After she received her iron, what happened is that her anemia started to get better. So with the IV, uh, infusion of the iron, she was able to make a little bit more hemoglobin. With reducing the anagrolide dose, she was less anemic. And guess what? When you took care of her iron deficiency, the platelets dropped, they came down. Why? Because in iron deficiency, the platelets typically go up, which is exactly what happens after you phlebotomize someone who has PV, and many of you may have experienced that. You do the phlebotomy, next thing you know, your platelet count starts to trend up. Why? Because we are inducing an iatrogenic state of iron deficiency. Needless to say, this is the most recent CBC I got on her from her physician. She had a normal white cell count, hemoglobin 11 point, almost normal, which is normal is 12 grams. Her platelets, okay, not completely optimized, but um, they're 900, they're better than 1.8 million, right? And uh, moreover, and most importantly for me and her, of course, is that her quality of life, her ability to function and do her daily uh, 
acts of daily living were back to normal. She's back to work. She feels great, and she's on a much lower dose of anagravide. I mean, so that doesn't mean that she still doesn't have the disease, but the point is to say that whenever someone has an MPN, MPN isn't the only reason, whichever disease we're dealing with, not the only disease that could occur, right? Your physician should, and that's what I was trying to say when, when I said individualized therapy. Other things could happen, infection, inflammation, uh, H. pylori, iron deficiency. A lot of things could happen in the course of the MPN, so you need to make sure that this isn't necessarily blamed on the MPN. And assessment of iron matters. And unfortunately, I keep saying this, no one really pays a lot of attention to iron stains. They might do it, but then nobody looks at it. And I think that's a huge mistake, because in this case, truly, that's what mattered in her situation. And then some of the symptoms, clearly, not all are attributed to MPN. Some may be attributed to other illnesses. So again, you and your physician should be able to identify which is which. And I do realize that that could be difficult at times, but there is a tendency to blame everything, not just by patients, but also by like primary care physicians, that once someone has an MPN, everything is MPN and it's drugs, which is, to me, is not right. Um, the other last piece I was going to say is that uh, the anemia can certainly be induced by not just the medications, but by also other conditions, like in this case, iron deficiency, and that the dose that you're giving your patient does matter. So just to wrap it up, this is just an example of how complicated um, caring for patients at MPN can be, and how we can be sort of misled if you just focus on the numbers, right? Wanting to control that platelet count is what caused all this trouble. I do realize there was an iron deficiency, but it was also in escalating those doses to unreal values is also what caused this patient to become even more anemic and with terrible quality of life. So I sympathize with all of you. I know that this is um, a rare condition, uh, but uh, we'll continue to educate people as we go by, and um, you are here, so I admire the fact that you're here to learn more about this and be active participant in your illness and your loved ones. So good luck to all of you, and thank you for listening.